Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, thank you very much, Emil, for this uh, inspirational talk. And uh, Martin for sharing so well this uh, first uh, Metamathemat uh, webinar of the day. So now we have some kind of a musical interlude. Uh, by that, I would say that we will have a roundup table on the future of metamaterials. So we would like to uh, focus perhaps on acoustic, thermal, and mechanical metamaterials. But people are really welcome also to uh, propose some uh, future of metamaterials in electromagnetism. Uh, we are really open-minded. So uh, please come forward with any uh, suggestion you might have on new challenges, space-time metamaterials, or scaling up, scaling down structures. So um, or on the mathematical side of things as well, if people see some great challenges to take. Perhaps, Emil, you have an idea of what might be the future. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was... Uh thinking of a of a new forum for uh for our idea i was thinking that there is no is there a journal dedicated to meta materials and meta structures and i was thinking how if we set up such a journal i was even thinking martin should be the he coined the the terminology of meta material so it would be very nice to, if martin could be the chief editor and uh, then we will have a nice forum for uh, for our ideas so I'm, i was looking the, if there is such maybe martin knows more if there is such a journal yeah. already a journal called um, meta materials and i'm reminding myself by googling it it was founded in the year 2007 uh, as part of Elsevier. And I think it has somehow disappeared, at least from my uh, screen, but I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Does anybody have solid knowledge about this? I remember no. that uh, I reviewed some articles for it. I did not publish there, but I was a referee once or twice for this journal Metamaterials, but long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I found it. it. It ran from 2007 to 2013. So oh. for some reason, it was discontinued nine years ago. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, so there is an opportunity. So let's keep it in mind. <laughs> what, what, what is your take on that, Martin? Well, um, I'm not sure I'm too much excited about this because what I like about meta materials is that you communicate, can communicate to a broader audience, not just to meta materials experts, but to the entire science community. So I'm actually quite happy with publishing in existing journals. And um, in parallel, there are so many um, special issues that come out on mechanical, on elastic meta materials. Actually, I think it's, it's getting almost too many of these special issues um, out there. So I'm not sure there is really a need for a dedicated journal on meta materials. And according to you, Martin, what would be a great challenge? I mean, if there is something that looks promising and really hard to, uh, to achieve. Or is everything mainstream now? No, I wouldn't say everything is mainstream. I mean, part of the community, that's at least my perception is trying to identify um, no-nonsense applications that might make it into something that looks like a product. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that is what you would call straightforward. Um, but there are other people, including me, that still may under around in a very large parameter space and that try to find out what is possible, in particular possible experimentally, um, for me, speaking for me, and what is perhaps not possible in the near future, um, just for the, for the heck of it, because of scientific curiosity, 
or for the joy of science, however you want to call this. Um, I'm not sure I can identify one huge uh, grand challenge uh, of the field as such at, at the moment. And uh, what is your take on uh, fabrication of quasi-periodic uh, media? It, it's still quite difficult to achieve, no? I mean, if you move to 3D. No, um, I mean, quasi-periodic structures have been made for optics and for elasticity um, in two and in three dimensions. Um, my gut feeling is still there got to be something super interesting one should be able to find in quasi crystals. Um, I must say I have not found it for myself so far. Okay. I have not seen the killer property that I can only get in a quasi periodic structure, but that may be my ignorance. Maybe others have their opinions on that. And uh... I mean, there are some people looking at uh, some kind of localization or Anderson localization effects in, uh, you know, weakly randomized metamaterials or things like that. Does it look like an exciting perspective or it's rather incremental? I mean, just perturbing locally the periodicity in, uh, with some kind of, you know, randomness. I'll say uh, yeah. you will have to, to observe the effect, you will have to be in the high contrast limit. Oh. It's, uh, it's very clear that if you take a steel bar and you, you modulate the parameters, but a very shallow modulation, if you tap on the bar, you'll hear the sound kilometers away. I mean, train rails are... Uh, an example they are not perfect while you tap on it it goes forever so the to really for the anderson localization to set in and be observed you really need to be in the high contrast regime <clears throat> okay so in that case we will not be in the continuum i'm not sure if that qualifies as continuum elasticity and we'll Will, will not have <clears throat> the same impact from the application point of view. <clears throat> will be a demonstration, but um, I should also say just in one dimension for a chiral system, there was an interesting uh, Anderson transition. Uh, when the winding number changes, then uh, one should see an interesting Anderson transition, and that was observed with um, uh, cold atoms in 2018, and that was actually one of the uh, highlights, scientific highlights for 2018. Okay. Now, if one follows with metamaterials, will that raise to the same? Perhaps not, because now it has been uh, observed, so it will be a repetition. And what about moving to biological systems? Because there were some attempts to, you know, uh, translate ideas of metamaterials in biological systems. But uh, perhaps this is something that, you know, people they manage, for instance, uh, to uh, control the diffusion of uh, drugs and things like that uh, with uh, ideas from, uh, you know, Metamaterials, so using effective medium theory, uh, having some kind of anisotropy inside of the system, these kinds of things, perhaps. Uh, yeah, for me, this would fall into the general category of applications of metamaterials. Okay, yeah. We are actually doing things like that together uh -huh. with Fred from biology. The basic yeah. idea is that cells grow in a way that depends on the elastic properties of what they're in or on. Okay. So if one plays with them, one has, that's the hope, some level of control over cell growth. I find this very interesting, but um, this can partly happen with existing metamaterials. Perhaps, um, and you're asking for big questions here, yeah. 
there is a challenge for, for theory or for design of metamaterials. In this particular example, what a biology might ask you for is, oh, I think that my cells that I care about would grow very special if you give me a metamaterial that has the following elasticity, following Cauchy elasticity tensor. And then he gives, he or she gives you all the elements of that tensor. And then um, I at least would not be in a position to come up with a structure that gives you these effective properties. And I think this inverse problem is generally not solved. It's solved in many examples and one has some intuition, but to my knowledge, there is no systematic way to get from wanted properties, wanted effective properties to, to microstructure. And I think this, at some point, this will become important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you remind people a, a bit uh, again, you know, your ideas, uh, you know, generic ideas about having three or four building block of a metamaterial and trying to come up with any kind of effective properties just with some elementary cells, but as few as possible. So uh, like, you know, by analogy of this uh, three, uh, you know, colors for printers some kind of cartridges, I mean, but for metamaterial building block. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, this is a vague dream. We are trying um, to, to get ourselves up to speed, something much more simple. We are looking into binary uh, <laughs> metamaterials where you have only two constituents, could be nothing, an air void or in some elastic material. You discretize, say, a unit cell either in two or three dimensions in how many pixels or voxels as you want. And you ask for the pixel or voxel distribution that gives you a certain elasticity tensor. We are going there by means of machine learning. But so far with, um, well, not complete success. Let me put it like that. Okay. So it's really the preliminary stage. Yeah. So per perhaps that's a big challenge, and Martin. Perhaps that's a. It's a, but it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting take in modeling this uh, classical uh, uh, dynamical models of liquids and uh, other substances. They use these um, very interesting models, uh, the sticky balls. So it's a ball which is colored and it has sticky, sticky parts and uh, color to color they uh, attract, color, different colors repel. Mm -hmm. And that exactly gives you sort of the right building blocks which uh, um, could give you quick, quick assembly. Uh, it's a mystery for me how one will uh, generate such uh, sticky balls and uh, <clears throat> how will uh, one assemble them in a desired way. But it's something which fascinated me for some time. And I can see that uh, the discussion really is all about acoustic and mecha mechanical metamaterials, but Surely there are still some uh, huge challenges in electromagnetic metamaterials, Martin, no? I mean, there are maybe some straightforward applications for, you know, the optical computer in uh, using metamaterials. Well, depends what you mean by the optical computer. I did my diploma thesis on the optical computer and I promised myself to never revisit this field. Uh, because I think there's no chance you will ever beat uh, digital electronic computers as we have them today by optics. Um, that's what I think. Um, but there are um, interesting opportunities in electromagnetism and optics too. Um, you, you know that quite some groups are going in the direction of tunable or space-time metamaterials. I mean, you can also basically say they are talking about uh, spatial modulators, spatial light modulators. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more mundane um, wording for it, but those are very important, actually. I mean, you know that David Smith is doing things like that, uh, like with phased antenna arrays for gigahertz frequencies. 
but there are many really interesting optical applications, beam steering, if you had the possibility to spatially modulate uh, in a decent manner the, the optical properties by some artificial structure that if you like, you can call a meta material. Um, that's definitely very, very useful, but I know that many groups have spent uh, much effort and with mediocre success <laughs> So far, there are, of course, modulators like liquid crystal modulators out there, but beating them in terms of whatever speed, bandwidth, etc., is not so easy. Mm -hmm. It would be important. I absolutely agree with that. Okay, I'm going to the other uh, part of, you know, uh, the spectrum. If you just look at, so we were in hundreds of terahertz. Now, if we look at the Hertz regime, so you can think of controlling this uh, low frequency waves such as ocean waves, earthquakes and there. I mean, we don't have this uh, challenge anymore of the nanotechnology, but we just need to, you know, um, be able to well, fabricate these things on a very large scale. And uh, there have been, for instance, some uh, European projects funded uh, within which people try to harvest energy. Uh, so there is, for instance, I think this European project Bohem, where they, they try to some or use uh, bio-inspiration to harvest elastic energy and they try to do this on a, on a large scale. So perhaps it's, uh, uh, it's also interesting perhaps uh, to, to look at this part of the spectrum because after all, a metamaterial is something that you can describe with effective medium theory, isn't it? So if you have super long wavelengths, uh, if yes. you can think of your, uh, you know, uh, even your city as a, some kind of effective medium, then you can achieve some uh, interesting phenomena. So, um, so I am um, ha energy harvesting is yeah. certainly will become uh, very important. In fact, already har uh, energy harvesting it's. Um, the terminology it's all over the place yeah I don't think it was like this five years ago but now um and many the models many models that i've seen involve some uh, non-linear effects mm -hmm. <laughs> and um i will that's one side which i will i will love to learn more how to investigate non-linear non effects. And in fact, everything starts from experiment. Um, and I am curious, how can we generate some control experiments where uh, uh, we can uh, rationalize a little bit these uh, non-linearities. For example, I was thinking uh, something that I could quickly, for example, generate a pendulum. <clears throat> A pendulum has uh, a magnet at the bottom, and then at uh, at the bottom, so the pendulum comes down, and on the bottom I put two attractive magnets. Therefore, the pendulum can oscillate around one magnet and around magnet. And now make an array of them. You can quickly generate domain walls, so all the all the uh, oscillate pendulum oscillate along this minimum. Mm -hmm while all of a sudden I switch and they oscillate in the other mid. And now, depending on how uh, strong I couple the pendulum this way, I can actually uh, create dispersion for these uh, domain walls. Now, how do they, they will behave? And uh, so clearly, if a wave comes this way, it can push the domain wall in one way and somehow harvest the energy <laughs> in quantized, quantized bits. Uh, so but I think kind of nonlinear effects. Nonlinear. I think this is a little bit missing in uh, the metamaterial research. 
control. So I know there are these nonlinearities which happens very fast, one system through a phase phase change, um, have this quick phase change. And uh, however, that happens way too 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 fast to actually take data and investigate what happens. What happens when two domains come together? <clears throat> um, will they will they collapse, flip each other, or they will move back? There are so many uh, things to learn. Uh, we can do modeling, but it's much much more interesting when we see them <laughs> happening in real in real systems. So some things that uh, as been a little bit uh, studied by uh, notably by people in Lome, uh, by uh, Vincent Tourna, and also uh, at Harvard by uh, Katia Bertoldi, are this kind of solitary waves in uh, mechanical metamaterials, and it's uh, it's it's quite quite funny. So uh, effectively, it's, it's nonlinear elasticity, and they gen generate some. Uh, so the deformation propagates inside of their metamaterial and uh, it's akin to uh, some kind of solitary wave. So uh, at least uh, they draw these kinds of analogies. So perhaps it's one of the futures, yeah, perhaps uh, moving yeah. towards this nonlinear physics. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, uh, going back to the large scale, uh, whenever you have, for instance, some uh, earthquake wave propagating, it's yeah. always in uh, you know viscoelastic medium or granular medium. So there is always some nonlinearity involved, and all the models that have been proposed of much of the models that have been proposed so far are just some linear approximations, and so we don't really know the validity yeah. of these models. Um, it's just to a certain extent. So. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, effectively, uh, this energy harvesting is, uh, I think, uh, it's not just a political game. Uh, I, I think it, uh, it can uh, bring some really fascinating uh, academic problems. Uh, yes, uh, so there is um, making um, materials better, stronger, more durable, I energy, yes. har and energy harvesting, and yeah. then sensing and let's say some form of uh, information processing yeah this uh, could be interesting directions in meta material for the later for sensing and some forms of processing one will have to have control over the phases of uh, so right now we are talking about wave steering but we are only uh we can only control the path, um, but not the phase. Uh, in other words, um, any information processing will come from some sort of interference effects. And um, uh, therefore, we must have phase control and phase engineering on top of uh, the wave steering. Can we achieve that with um, with the precision that is needed. And uh, if you compute, you will quickly see that they are major, major challenging. So you will have to have, for example, uh, control over the phase with uh, less than 1% or even less if it is to uh, do even a, a simplest uh, calculation. Or, one thing that seems to uh, be left out of all these games is uh, invisibility cloaks. There was, you know, some uh, excitement from people like 15 years ago, but now I don't think people are excited anymore about this possibility to console uh, a region from waves. I don't know. It seems that uh, people uh, have moved uh, away from uh, these ideas, but I saw this. These ideas are very, uh, very fundamental because this idea of anisotropy, I think it's at the core of physics, no? Uh, anisotropy, controlled anisotropy, uh, I think it's still... Uh, and you know, you had some kind of crazy ideas with people of the group of Alan Greenleaf uh, and envisioning this kind of uh, wormhole, electromagnetic wormhole 
uh, that would allow uh, to, to move from one region of space to another. And if it's a space-time wormhole, perhaps uh, moving from regi one region of space to another almost uh, well, immediately, instantaneously. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, but maybe this can be done, no, experimentally with uh, time-modulated media, this kind of experiments. Yeah, my feeling is a lot has been done there, Sebastian. Um, I mean, experiments were not perfect, but many concepts, be it for elastic waves, acoustic waves, uh, electromagnetic waves, have successfully been demonstrated in by using metamaterials and... Um, if one has now a killer application that you want to realize along these lines, then it might be fun to get into that. But in terms of concepts, I think a lot has been done simply. Uh, and that's why I think the excitement um, about cloaking, etc., has cooled down a bit in the community. I still like it, but um, <laughs> I don't actively work on it myself uh, anymore either. Yes. Maybe there are interesting things you can do, not about cloaking, but using um, spatial transformations. Uh, I was lately wondering, say, if you could build a guitar. You want to build a very nice sounding guitar. Okay. Very often, nice sounding guitars are big. They have big bodies to resonate and give you mm -hmm. low resonance frequencies, blah. In principle, it should be should be possible to put some meta material into the guitar that would allow you to make a much smaller body that still has the <laughs> resonance properties and the same overtones, etc. Perhaps people could get excited about things like that, but I'm just fantasizing here. Yeah. But, um, you know, Martin McCall, he had this kind of uh, crazy idea of uh, the space-time cloak or history editor. So... Uh, not only having a spatial, but also a, a temporal transform. And so uh, we are not so far from this, no, with time modulated uh, media. We, we can now act upon the time variable uh, as well. We can map this onto something else. And perhaps uh, somehow uh, this can, uh, cannot this realize the dream of teleportation? I, I don't know. Yes, with, with, with time modulated. Yeah. Uh, well, I will guess you'll need a lot of energy at the end to, to <laughs> implement a teleportation. Yeah. So I, uh, so anybody made an estimate on how much will it cost to teleport? <laughs> Human being. It might be that, okay, we will need all the resources we have uh, on Earth, <laughs> or we will need stars to actually make, make the energy. Of the internet, uh, I forget the numbers, but people estimate by fairly reasonable arguments that you need humongous amounts of energy to do that, um, that are totally ridiculous for any yeah. practical purpose. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. well, yeah. Well, now we kind of start to conquer the, the space around Earth. And so this is the first space revolution. And I guess the second revo revolution will come where, so now we could, we could prepare for the second revolution where we can conquer the, the space around our sun and uh, <laughs> build structures and around our sun. But surely metamaterials can have uh, some interesting applications for this. Uh, you were mentioning conquering, you know, for instance, all these satellites that will be in different orbits, you know, the. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, in order to be able to uh, to focus a beam on a given satellite and follow some satellite, and maybe we need the technology of metamaterials to be super uh, super accurate. Maybe uh, maybe uh, for telecommunications. Uh, yeah. we... 
Uh, yeah, and speaking of space reminds me of gravitational waves. And I recently read that there are ongoing projects by people working on gravitational wave detectors to use uh, matter materials to reduce the impact of uh, all kinds of noise sources onto the mirrors in gravitational wave detectors. But, but you published something along these lines as well, Martin, didn't you? Oh, that has, that's a different story. Oh, um, that's a different story. There's stuff going on just for noise reduction that you don't couple external noise to okay. um, the mirrors that serve as the end mirrors in the gravitational interferom interferometer. Um, sounds quite reasonable to me. Um, I would say from, from a meta materials viewpoint, mm -hmm. speaking about huge concepts like cloaking and blah, this is a fairly simple um, task, but still it's, it's interesting, I think, to pursue that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but, but so yeah. I think the, the, the paper you, you published uh, was about having something, some kind of mechani mechanical metamaterials that would allow you to... Uh, to, to measure the gravitational waves, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, the basic idea yeah. was to not measure it by an interferometer, yeah. but convert the um, gravitational strain by a chiral structure into a twist, and then measure angles instead of measuring, measuring um, interference of light. It was a crazy idea. The numbers don't look so bad but it was not at all well appreciated by the community of gravitational wave uh, people. So, so can you tell us the size, the sizes? How, how long will such structure need to be? Will oh, it be the same, same scale? server wouldn't be so big. It's not a kilometer long structure. We're okay. rather talking order one meter or so. It would be okay. much more compact because uh -huh. it's not based on interference of light where you always want long cavities to accumulate the strain and get some significant length change. It's not based on that at all. It's based on, on angle changes. So this, those things would be much, much smaller. But I mean, admittedly, you would need some crazy material parameters to get the resonance frequencies up. You would have to build something uh, ideally out of diamond a huge diamond uh, structure, so it's it's a little crazy. But can we say, uh, for example, this uh, difficulty on detecting long wave uh, <clears throat> waves, I will guess the same, uh, the same idea could work. Like uh, a, a long wave... Uh, you mean tsunami, for instance? Signal in water or... Uh, yeah. Uh, air, yeah, I yeah. would say this could be a, a sensor which uh, could detect. Yeah, this, earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, things like that. Yes, yeah, totally agreed. Yeah, because for, for this type of uh, phenomena, we don't have really sensors which uh, act and, properly, and, and it's down to earth applications. I mean, this can save. Uh, Yes. Potentially saves uh, thousands of lives. Yeah. So, so maybe, uh, yeah. Martin, yeah. if you take your structure and it, it let it be stretchable by the wave passing through the medium. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure about that. Um, there are actually uh, efforts in the geophysics community to use optical fibers in the ground and interference of light uh, to which the, um, the strain field couples by locally changing the length of an optical fiber. And it's actually quite interesting. It has been shown even that this is not only a detector of, of uh, normal strain, normal elastic strain in the, in the earth. You can even use it as a distributed sensor. So you, so to speak, have an array of sensors by having that. You can spatially resolve uh, the elastic wave. And it seems to be quite sensitive. And uh, to me, this sounds like a much more sensible thing to do than putting huge arrays of these uh, seismic detectors onto the surface. Um, mm -hmm. But people are working on that, but that has nothing to do with metamaterials. This is just smart usage of interference of light in optical fibers.
Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I think actually, uh, Stéphane Brulé, um, he was with us some, at, at some point. He uh, is uh, taking part uh, in a project in France uh, with this uh, optical fiber. Uh, I mean, it's a network of optical fibers, and uh, it's a pilot project where they, where they monitor, uh, you know, uh, an earthquake activity using this network of optical fibers. And I think they actually, uh, the, it's in the region of uh, Lyon, the city of Lyon, and I think they are using an existing network of optical fibers uh, to, uh, that's, that's the trick. And uh, yes, yeah, they, are, they are doing it for real. It's a pilot project, so I'm not sure this will be uh, implemented on the large scale, and, but they are looking into it. And uh, yeah, so, um, but personally, I mean, I'm not expert at all in uh, gravitational waves, but I found your, your idea of scaling down, you know, uh, these large interferometers quite fascinating because, okay, you say you need a huge diamond, but the cost anyway of this, you know, interferometers is huge as well. So if you compare cost to cost, perhaps it's not ridiculous at all. <laughs> Uh, and, and also having something which you can fit in a lab rather than, you know, taking a few kilometers of uh, land. That, yes, that. and schools and universities could, could afford an instrument like that on a, in, a, in, a, in the campus. I call, I call this democratizing the, <laughs> <laughs> the science. Yeah. Yes, okay. but this idea was never worked out, perhaps in sufficient detail by us. And um, look, the reactions we got from probably people who are in the LIGO or Virgo. Ah, okay. <laughs> not friendly. This are not <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, review reports I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> Well, you're essentially telling them, look, guys, we have a much simpler, uh, well, much more compact. Uh, yeah, they might. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so that was a very nice discussion. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I think now uh, we, we well deserve a coffee break. Yes. And uh, so uh, at, at, at 5 p.m. London time, so 6 p.m. Uh, Paris and KIT uh, time, we will have this uh, great talk by uh, Oliver, uh, which I think will be really amusing. And uh, OK, if you can still join, that would be fantastic. And uh, OK, see you. See you soon then. Okay. Bye. OK. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.